Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Mariah Mitchell Association Science Speaker Series. It is Wednesday, July 26th, and it is such a pleasure to welcome our esteemed and distinguished presenter this evening, Dr. Brian Fields. Dr. Fields will be presenting his talk on When Stars Attack, Near-Earth Supernova Explosions and Their Radioactive Fingerprints. Dr. Fields is a professor of astronomy at the University of Illinois, where he is also an affiliate professor of physics. He studies the inner space outer space connections that link the science at the smallest and largest scales to each other. He is particularly interested in the highest energy sites in nature, the Big Bang, exploding stars or supernovae, and high energy particles in space, such as cosmic rays, where all fundamental forces play essential roles. He is fascinated by the way that human narrative is ultimately linked to that of cosmic events that largely pass unremarked, but ultimately shape our lives. It is such a pleasure to welcome Dr. Fields this evening. And we would especially like to thank our sponsors, our main sponsor, Bank of America, as well as our affiliate sponsors, Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and the White Elephant Hotels and Resorts. Without our sponsors, this event would not be accessible to all of our viewers and our patrons. Without further ado, or ado rather, I present to you Dr. Fields. Welcome. How are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, so can I share my screen? You can share your screen, screen whenever you are ready. <laughs> uh, oh, I see. All right. Very good. Well, uh, thank you, Janelle and the association for the opportunity uh, to speak. And thank you all for uh, for giving up your time on this, uh, what by all accounts is a gorgeous summer's evening in Nantucket. So I, I hope to make it worth your while. Um, so um, uh, there, there are many remarkable things about Mariah Mitchell, but uh, one that's particularly striking to me is uh, how broad her interests are in, in all of science, and this got passed on in her, her legacy. Um, so, of course, she was interested in astronomy, which is dear to my heart, but, uh, but also in ecology, biodiversity, and marine science. And today's talk, what I'll be talking to you about, uh, will also be an example of how science weaves with the longest of threads, because um, we'll take a look at how, uh, how cosmic events can have an impact on Earthlings, because we will be talking about what happens when stars attack. And I'm speaking not of ill-behaved Hollywood celebrities, but actual astronomical objects, in that we'll be talking about near-Earth supernova explosions and how we know that there have been such things. Spoiler alert, there have been supernova explosions near the Earth uh, recently in astronomical terms. And we know this through their radioactive fingerprints. And by the end of the talk, I hope that all of that and these pictures all make sense. So. Uh, so without further ado, here's the game plan. So if you're willing to believe me, then you can go out and enjoy the beach. Uh, so first, we'll talk about supernova explosions and how they are brighter than a billion suns. Um, and we'll talk about explosions now and explosions that occurred in the past. Um, and then we'll bring the problem a little closer to home and talk about what happens if a supernova were to blow up uh, near the Earth, uncomfortably near the Earth. And we'll talk about how close is too close. Uh, and then uh, the question is, did this ever happen? And we want to find evidence. And so we need to do supernova archaeology. And it turns out that is possible. And the way to do this is to look for debris from the explosion on the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then uh, if there's time, uh, I'll talk about uh, a possible instance where the, quite a long time ago, 360 million years ago, where this may have happened uh, and, uh, uh, and how we can see if that is in fact the case. Uh, but first things first, let's talk about what supernova explosions are. Um, and so one of the nice things, we have gorgeous images here. So this is uh, an image, this is an x-ray vision image of uh, supernova hundreds of years after it exploded. So, but first things first. Um, let's, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful summer's night, uh, school's out. So let's, uh, uh, let's all get on the same page, uh, as we settle in. So let's talk about stars. 
um because ultimately we're interested today in the depths of certain stars so let's talk about stars generally and let me uh, get you up to speed on a few facts that will not be uh, terribly remarkable to you first stars are constantly losing energy so here's a beautiful image of the sun and uh it is throwing its light out into space and most of the way the sun loses energy is by pouring light into space some of it's visible some of it's not visible uh but it's uh but that the energy is going out it lights up the sky for us very nice and it gives us uh ultimately it's the source of uh the power for life on earth um okay fair enough you already knew that uh, another thing that will not be remarkable to you is that the sun and other stars have a finite mass. When I say finite, I don't mean a small mass. I just mean not an infinite mass. Um, so, uh, but because they have a finite, not infinite mass, stars have a finite, not infinite fuel supply. Uh, and whatever that fuel is, we'll get to that. Uh, whatever the fuel is, they have a limited amount of fuel. So they have a limited amount of energy inside of them uh, uh, that uh, at their disposal. Um, so stars are constantly losing energy, they have a limited supply of energy, and then finally, one of the fundamental principles of science is that energy is conserved. So energy can be uh, can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be moved around from uh, from place to place in space, can change forms, but energy cannot be created or destroyed. And when you put all those three, then none of those facts are controversial. None of those things uh, uh, did you need to go to a fancy uh, uh, to get a PhD in in, uh, uh, in astrophysics to understand. But if you put all those three together. Uh, they uh, uh, they they have an important uh, implication. In fact, more than one important implication. So uh, this is where I turn it over to you. Uh, see if anybody's awake. So put these three things together, and there's an uncomfortable uh, conclusion that you're forced to. Let's see if I can see the. If anyone you... wants to respond, you can request to speak and. I can give you permission to talk or you can pop any questions or responses into the Q&A box viewers at home. People are being shy. I bet people know, but they're just being shy. This happens in class all the time. Definitely. <laughs> all right. All right. Anybody want to take a stab? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I will not, like I said, school is out, so uh, I'm not here to, uh, to torment you. So, uh, so, well, if stars are losing energy, and they've only got a, they only start out with a finite amount, and they can't get more because energy is conserved, they can't just get more out of nothing. And so if you put all that together, it means that that energy supply that's allowing stars to glow, uh, that energy supply is going to get used up at some point. It's sort of like if you have a flashlight, it's got a battery, sooner or later, the battery goes out, the flashlight goes out, it's exactly the same idea. So stars can't live forever. Um, and because stars can't live forever, uh, that uncomfortably means that the sun is, a, is our favorite example, and so that means all stars are going to die. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've already bummed you out, uh, but there's an important follow-up question. So how long do we have for the sun? And I'm happy to report we've got another 5 billion years or so to go with the sun. So circular, ca circular calendar then, otherwise we're in fine shape. And then there's one last implication here. So if you think about this, that uh, stars don't live for an infinite amount of time. They live for a finite amount of time. It's billions of years, but that's not an infinite amount of time. And yet we see stars in the sky today. And we see stars in the sky today, and yet they live uh, not an infinite amount of time. And that means they weren't always here, which means they had to be born. Um, and so stars not only die, but they have to be born. Uh, and so if you put all that together, what it tells you is stars have life cycles. So like Paramecia, puppies and people, stars born, mature, and die. Um, and so uh, on a good portion of astronomy is trying to understand this, the, the life cycles of stars from birth through to death and even afterlife. And that will be an essential part of the story today. Uh, because today we will be interested in uh, the deaths of stars. In fact, not even the deaths of most stars, but the spectacular deaths of the most radical celebrities of the cosmos. Um, and to get you in the mood for that, this picture here uh, has uh, is a quite remarkable picture. It's from the Hubble telescope. And there are two main 
things you see in this picture, two main objects. So one, this thing that's kind of shown diagonally here so you can see it big on the screen, uh, that is a galaxy. Uh, not our galaxy, but one not so unlike ours, a disk galaxy. And what you're seeing here, it looks kind of fuzzy, like that's uh, like it's a cloud or something like that. But in fact, uh, what you're seeing is the combined light of something like 100 billion stars. And the galaxy is so far away that even the Hubble telescope can't make them out individually. You just see the, the, this smear of light. Uh, and so and that's, a, that's a galaxy very similar to ours. That's a remarkable thing. We could spend all night just talking about that. But I want to draw your attention to this dot of light over here, which you notice is way out in the suburbs of this galaxy. It's not far from the center, but it's part of the galaxy kind of out in the burbs. Um, and this is the light from one exploding star. So this is from uh, a supernova explosion. This explosion happened in 1994. It was the fourth one found. That's why it's called D. Um, and if you kind of squint, you can see that the total amount of light coming out from this exploding star uh, is about the same as the total amount of light coming from all the rest of the galaxy, all the 100 billion stars, which means at its peak, a supernova is as bright as about 100 billion stars. So they really are quite powerful explosions. Um, now they don't stay bright forever. The explosion crashes into space uh, and, uh, uh, and grows and grows and forms a gigantic bubble. And if you wait tens of thousand years later, so not that same supernova. Now you look at a place where a different supernova occurred. What you find is there's this hot bubble that's left over, which we call a supernova remnant. And so this, uh, and it's behind my head as well, this is an example of a supernova remnant. And let me give you a sense of scale. Um, so from end to end, from side to side, this, uh, this bubble here is about 300 light years across. So it's big enough that it takes light 300 years to go across. Uh, and, uh, and stars in our galaxy, neighboring stars, are about three light years, give or take. Uh, apart. And so uh, so this is an enormous cavity with many, many stars in it because its its diameter is a hundred times the distance between neighboring stars. So this is a gigantic amount of space. So this is how powerful a supernova is. It can blow a bubble that's on on sort of interstellar scales. Um, and, uh, so th those are supernovae that we can see in nearby galaxies, and we can use the power of our telescopes to take pictures of them. But supernovae have gone off throughout the history of the universe, and some of them occurred before we had power to powerful telescopes, but we have examples in recorded history. And we have examples in recorded history of supernovae that were in our own galaxy, not in distant galaxies. Um, and there's a particularly famous one that was about uh, uh, a thousand years ago, not quite a thousand years ago. In 1054 AD, there was an incredible light in the sky. Oddly, in Europe, there's no record of this. But in China, the, they, the, uh, the imperial astronomers saw this and they left a record. So here's their journal record of this. And they referred to this as a guest star, which is a beautiful term, I think, uh, which came and went. Uh, and it wasn't just seen in China, the, in the Southwest of the United States, the Anasazi people uh, uh, were these, these wonderful astronomers and uh, studied the sky uh, very well. And they had these amazing uh, rock paintings. And I'm no anthropologist, but what you can see here is there's a, a hand that's supposed to mean it's significant, I, I'm led to believe, a crescent moon and, uh, and this star-like thing. And it looks like that that's their own record of the same thing that was seen in the Chinese records. Um, so it was seen around the world, but interestingly, no records in Europe. Um, and if we take a modern view, if we take the Chinese records uh, uh, and other records and look at the region of the sky where they saw this, this is what you see today. This again is a Hubble telescope image as well as an image from an X-ray telescope. And so this is what's called the Crab Nebula. You can see it with your naked eye uh, if you're lucky. Um, and, uh, and so this is what's left over from this explosion a thousand years later. And you can see there's this hot gas here and it looks like there's sort of a dot here and this kind of, this kind of swirls around it. Um, and uh, all of those are important for our story today. Um, another example of a supernova in recorded history uh, is one where we have a detailed firsthand account. Uh, and this happened in November 11th, 1572. So it's getting towards the era of modern science. And one of the pioneer, pioneers of modern science, Tycho Brahe, uh, who was a Danish astronomer, 
uh, made a beautiful account of this supernova, which he called not a guest star, but a new star, Nova Stella, he wrote in Latin, and there it is. And here's the chart of where the star is. It's in the constellation Cassiopeia. If you look there today, you won't see this, uh, but you'll see the rest of the stars. Um, and if you take a modern view with X-ray vision, what you'll see is this. Um, so this, again, is the remains of a supernova explosion that is still so incredibly hot. It's millions of degrees, and so it's crackling with X-rays hundreds of years uh, after the explosion. Um, and the amazing thing, there's Tycho. Uh, he was a nobleman, so you can see he's got quite the get up there. Um, and he left a record, a written record of what he saw. So it's a firsthand account of what it's like to look at a nearby supernova. And so, uh, so here's how it goes. He says, on the 11th day of November, in the evening after sunset, I noticed that a new and unusual star surpassing the other stars in brilliancy was shining. And since I had from boyhood known all the stars of the heavens perfectly, it was quite evident to me that there had never been any star in that place of the sky. I was so astonished of this sight, a miracle indeed, one that had never been previously seen before our time in any age since the beginning of the world. I love this quote. And what's great about it is uh, Tycho was a was a astute scientist and a very good scientist. He also did not have a, a, a small ego. He did not lack for confidence. And he got a lot of important things right, but he actually got some things wrong. And it's interesting to short, sort this out. I don't know if anybody wants to take a stab. So there are some very important things he got right. So what did Tycho say here that's correct? And there's a bunch of things he says that are correct. Anybody want to take a stab? Again, I don't mean to torment you with this. But just, you can be asking yourself as you look through. Um, so you guys are free to raise your hands to answer any questions. Yeah, I'll give people a chance if you want. And then I can give the spoilers. <laughs> All right. Um, so the spoilers are, he gets a lot of things right. It certainly was unusual. It certainly was brilliant. And he actually did know all the stars of the heavens perfectly. I mean, and Tycho was not a modest man, but he was a really good astronomer. He did know the stars of the heavens perfectly. And he knew that he there did nothing for him to see in this point of the sky before. Absolutely right. But he actually got some things wrong. And so let me take you through that. Uh, there's several things. He said this was a new star. Now, it's not, it's a little unfair to take off for this, but what he thought this is the appearance of a new star, um, but actually this was the disappearance of a star that actually prior had been too dim for him to see, but then it flared up and then died away. So uh, instead of adding to the number of stars, take the number of stars in the sky and add one, it actually subtracted one. That's what we call a sign error in, uh, in astronomy. We usually don't take off very much for that on your homework. Um, and he said there'd never been any star in that place of the sky. It's a bit unfair because he couldn't have seen it with his naked eye, but there certainly had been a star there. And the thing that is quite remarkable, he said, there's never been anything like this previously seen before our time. And that's just, that's just arrogant. He has no way of knowing that. And I just showed you we have, we have other evidence for earlier events. Um, okay. Um, so, so these things are absolutely remarkable to look at. What's really going on? Let's get under the hood and see how do they really work? And what a supernova is, is uh, the death throes of the most massive stars. So the things that lead to supernovae, the progenitors are stars that are more than eight times, eight or so times, maybe 10 times the mass of the sun. So the sun will not die this way. And actually most stars will not die this way, but very massive stars will. Uh, and uh, so let's go through the life cycles of these very massive stars. Like all stars, massive stars are born in cold clouds of gas. So what you're seeing here, these columns are sometimes called the pillars of creation. That's one of the most famous Hubble telescope pictures. And this is a gigantic region in space, a huge cloud of gas and dust in space. Um, uh, where even the smallest features here are larger than the solar system. And, uh, and these, these cold clouds of gas are the raw material for stars and new stars are busy being born here. You can see some little red dots uh, uh, across this thing. And those are new stars being born in this cloud. Um, and so most of these stars will not be massive. Most of them will be the mass of the sun or even lower. And a small handful will be very massive stars. And those are the ones we're interested in. They're rare, but, uh, uh, but spectacular. And uh, an example where this process has gone even further is the Orion Nebula. So it's not up now in the summer, but in the winter, you can see Orion. In Orion's belt, there's this little blob you can see with your naked eye. And when you zoom in, uh, what you see is it's another site of the birth of new stars. And you can see these very bright stars. There are four of them at the center of Orion. Uh, those are called the trapezium because they make a trapezoid. And these are all massive stars. Um, and so there's only a handful of them but they are all 
all doomed to die. Um, and this is a nice example that massive stars are social. They are born in clusters with other stars and typically other massive stars. And almost all of them are in binaries. They have a partner, they orbit around each other and they typically are in binaries with other massive stars. So they're very social critters. Um, and like all stars, massive stars, they've got a huge amount of mass, which is in the form of gas, and they're drawn together by their own gravity. And in fact, their lives, the lives of all stars, including the sun, are a struggle against their own gravity. So a star like the sun or massive star, uh, the gravity is trying to pull all the gas of the star into the center of the star. And actually, if nothing intervened, it would collapse all the way down to the center and become a black hole. And the reason this doesn't happen is because the weight of the star crushes the material of the star and makes it very hot at the center, so hot that it, it turns on nuclear fusion at the center of the star, which makes it really hot, millions of degrees, and that makes the star nice and pressurized, and that holds up the star. The pressure of the star, the gas pressure, fights against gravity and makes the star nice and stable. Um, uh, but what happens is, uh, as the star undergoes nuclear fusion, changing light elements to heavy elements, uh, which is the opposite of what you'll see in the Oppenheimer movie, where you take heavy elements and make them light. Uh, that, uh, so we start with hydrogen, the lightest element, we burn it to helium, and then the helium gets burned to oxygen and carbon, and so on to neon, magnesium, all the way down to iron. <clears throat> so the nuclear fusion makes heavier and heavier elements until the center of the star is full of iron. And it turns out, at that point, it's actually not possible to make heavier elements, or you could, but it actually would take energy away from the star and not, uh, not generate heat. Uh, and so that that marks the, the exhaustion of fuel of the star. And when that's over, the star collapses on its under its own weight and, uh, and then gets crushed at the center to incredibly high densities, makes some interesting object like a neutron star or a black hole. And then the rest of the star slams down and bounces back and we get a supernova explosion. And this is an example of the first days of a supernova explosion. So. Uh, so the deaths of massive stars are marked by supernova explosions that come after making a whole bunch of elements at the center of the star. Um, and so one of the other lessons is that stars are element factories and massive stars are especially uh, uh, effective uh, element factories. They're, they make all kinds of elements and then they are exploded and those elements are ejected into space. And so this is just an artist's conception here, but this is a real image, again, taken with X-ray vision um, and the colors are because we can tag, uh, there's like a barcode for the different elements and we can tag the elements we see. And we see there's lots of iron as we should see, lots of silicon and magnesium, uh, which you can see here. But then the blue is uh, that there's also some amount of radioactivity here. This happens to be a radioactive form of titanium. Um, and uh, uh, and the, the lesson here is that in the blizzard of nuclear reactions going on in these stars, we make not only ordinary stable elements, but some unstable radioactive elements. So radioactivity just means the element is unstable and the atoms want to change to something more stable. And when they do, they emit little flashes of light and we can see them. And that's how we can see that this titanium is there. So stars are not only element factories, they're radioactivity factories. Okay, great. Um, and so the upshot then, of, of this little whirlwind tour is the circle of life. So in our galaxy and other galaxies, we've got these clouds of gas, they condense uh, to form these dense objects, these molecular clouds that form stars, the stars live their lives and then eventually die and explode, uh, leaving behind some very dense object, but most of their guts with all their new elements are ejected into space, mixed with the gas that's already out there. And then we go around and around in this circle and ever more heavy elements are built up throughout the galaxy. And we need those heavy elements to even exist in the first place. The iron in your blood, the silicon in your computers, the carbon in your DNA uh, come from exploding stars. Okay, so we are made from the nuclear ashes of stars. We need, st we need stars to have died to even be alive today. Uh, so stars are the giver of life, but you don't want them to get too close. All right, so far so good. Questions? You'll have other opportunities for questions. There's something burning. I wanted to give you the chance. Um, uh, but if not, then you'll get other opportunities. So let's just keep going. Okay, so we, so we got a whirlwind tour of stars in general and supernovae in particular. Let's now talk about what happens if they get too close. So what happens if we have a supernova near the earth? So this 
is a star that blew up in 1987 uh, that was in actually not even in our own galaxy. It was actually a little baby, baby galaxy in our backyard. So this actually isn't even close enough for what I mean by a nearby supernova. It's just a good picture that I had. So, uh, so let me say what I mean about near Earth supernovae. So supernova explosions happen throughout our galaxy. Our galaxy is still forming stars, and some of those stars are massive, and those massive stars blow up as supernova explosions. And our, this is not our galaxy. This is another galaxy very similar to ours, but this is kind of what our galaxy would look like. It's a spiral galaxy, and we live kind of on the outskirts of a spiral arm where stars are busily being formed. Um, and in a galaxy like ours, uh, there are something like one or two or three supernova explosions per century throughout the entire galaxy which means most of them are quite far away, which means they're spectacular to see if you're so lucky as to see them, but they're completely harmless. Um, and now I'm happy to report today, there are no nearby massive stars. There are no nearby stars that become supernovae. So please sleep well tonight. There are things to worry about in this world, but nearby supernovae are not one of them. But over the four and a half billion year history of the earth, there have been many nearby events. Statistically, it's very likely there have been very many nearby events. So if we care about our ancestors or you worry about your descendants, then we really should care about near earth supernova explosions. And why is it bad to have a supernova blow up near the earth? Well, the Surgeon General has told us supernovae are dangerous to your health. They're a biohazard. And the interesting thing is why, and it's, uh, uh, and for, a realistic case, it's not necessarily the first thing you would think of. There is biological damage if a supernova is too close. And the this was quickly realized uh, soon after we realized what supernovae were about 100 years ago, a little, a little more than that. Um, and the holy grail or unholy grail of this field is to connect a supernova explosion to a mass extinction, a big die off of species on the earth, of which there are quite a number. Um, and so you can ask, what's the, what are the ill effects of these weapons of mass destruction? And again, weapons of mass destruction are nothing to joke about, but that's really the appropriate comparison. Um, and it turns out the effects are actually, the most important effects are maybe not the first thing you would uh, think of. The explosion is too, too far away to like blow the atmosphere off the earth or something like that. For any realist explosion, that won't happen. But it turns out there are effects like these explosions give off these crazy high energy particles uh, of various forms called cosmic rays, uh, and uh, these eventually make their way to Earth. They irradiate the Earth. They're stopped by the atmosphere, but they create additional high energy particles called muons, which are quite dangerous. And uh, and they go deep into the Earth. They go uh, they go hundreds of yards uh, underground and into the water. So you can't even hide underground to get away from them. Uh, and they're indirect effects because it turns out actually another. Another really dangerous thing is these nearby supernova explosions emit a lot of nasty X-rays and gamma rays, and those wipe out the ozone layer in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, so, uh, so now back in the past, we did our own damage to the ozone. We used some bad spray cans. We got rid of them. The ozone has come back. Uh, but I'm talking about wiping out a large chunk of the ozone over, uh, over the Earth, uh, and, uh, and it stays gone for years. Um, and so that's bad because the ozone is needed to shield us from ultraviolet light from the sun. And if the ozone is grievously damaged, then the sun's UV rays are nearly unshielded. Uh, and then uh, there's a huge amount of ultraviolet light. And you and I would put on hats and sunblock 2000 and do the best we can, but small plants and bacteria, phytoplankton at the bottom of the food chain can't do that. And then the idea is that those die off and then everything that eats them die off and it's bad. Um, and that's how you get a mass extinction. And when you think about all this, again, the damage goes all the way up. And when you think about the, all this and work it out, it turns out the minimum safe distance is about 30 light years. And again, the nearest star is about three light years. So this is actually quite a close range. And I'm happy to report there are no threatening stars within that range today. So again, sleep easy tonight. Um, all right, so far so good. Okay, we'll plow on then. Uh, so that leads us to supernova archeology. span um, So, uh, so supernovae occur in our galaxy and are ongoing. They, we see them in historical records uh, and uh, there are, will be supernovae in the future of our galaxy. So they existed in the past, they will come in the future. So they are just a fact of life for living in the Milky Way. Um, and so 
uh, once in a while, there should have been supernovae with near the Earth, and how could we find out what they are? And so that's the archaeology I'm going to talk about. And it turns out to do this archaeology, uh, we need very sensitive instruments, and this nuclear physics lab is one of the sensitive instruments that we need. Um, so let me walk you through how this works. Um, so the basic idea is real simple. A supernova is a gigantic bomb, and if it occurs near the Earth, some of the debris from the bomb, the shrapnel from the bomb, will land on the Earth uh, and literally then hit the atmosphere and literally rain upon our heads. Um, and so to give you a very not to scale idea of how this works, this is none of one of these uh, uh, images of a supernova explosion seen in X-ray vision. Uh, and this explosion happens. And remember, the, the material is launched at a few percent of the speed of light and starts sweeping out matter in space to make this giant bubble that it's going to make. And so this uh, supernova debris, the debris is plowing through interstellar matter and it comes towards the Earth. And very much not to scale, I've shown the sun here. Uh, and except I'm, I've done a funny thing. This is what the sun looks like if you cover up the disk of the sun itself so you don't get lost in the glare. And you can see around the sun, there's this streams of material, the streams of gas. That's a wind coming off the sun. If you saw the solar eclipse, if you got to see totality, all the material around the sun, that's part of the solar wind. Um, and uh, so there's a breeze of material coming off the sun. So a flow of gas going off the sun and it goes out throughout the solar system, it comes past, past the earth, goes out throughout the solar system. Um, and so there's a flow of gas off of the sun. There's this blast wave coming in from the supernova and the sun is trying to shield us now. Now the sun's a good guy trying to shield us, but then there's a collision between the supernova material and the wind from the sun. Um, and if the blast is close enough, it pushes the solar wind, the, this, this sort of cocoon that the sun is making to protect us, it pushes that in to the inner solar system, and then supernova material is, uh, is able to rain upon the Earth. And supernova debris then accumulates eventually in the, in the bottom of the ocean, among other places. So that's the idea. Um, and to give you an idea how this works, I've got a simulation here uh, that we did a while ago. Uh, so this is a computer simulation of how this would work. And what I'm showing you, oops, oh, there we go. Uh, so the way this works is the sun is here at this little white spot. Whoops, I'm sorry, having so much trouble with this. Ah, all right. So what I wanted to show you is that the, the supernova blast gets blown back uh, and the supernova material gets to the inner solar system. And so the, the supernova junk, all the crazy elements the, solar, the supernova made can rain upon our head. Um, and so, uh, so, so I'm here to tell you supernova debris should rain upon our heads and find its way to the bottom of the ocean. And then the question is, how would we know if this happened millions of years ago, how would we know it happened? So we've got to go dig up stuff from the bottom of the ocean and then find material where we can say, aha, this came from a supernova. So we need a supernova fingerprint. And we saw that supernova are nuclear reactors. So we want to take advantage of that somehow. Um, so we could look for the new elements the supernova made and remember what did it make? It made a lot of iron, a lot of oxygen, silicon. That's great. We could look for that. But there's a problem, ordinary iron, oxygen, and silicon, the ordinary stable stuff that's in your blood, computer uh, um, and bones, uh, the trouble with that is uh, that's already on the earth. So you can't tell what came from the super, it's just, just oxygen is oxygen, iron is iron, you can't tell what's what. So you can't tell what came from a supernova. So that's a bad idea. Um, but remember, Supernova explosions are radioactivity factories. They don't or only make stable elements, they make unstable radioactive elements. And the beauty of this is radioactive elements decay over time. They're like little clocks. They last for a certain amount of time and then they decay and they become other more stable elements. Um, and so what we wanna do is find live radioisotopes, which is to say radioactive elements that have not decayed yet. Um, and so uh, the idea is, that the Earth doesn't have those. Uh, and so if you find them, it's come from a supernova. So let me explain how this works. Uh, if all this fancy supernova stuff is too hard to understand uh, uh, on a warm summer's night, uh, just think of green bananas. Um, so like uh, radioactive atoms, uh, bananas uh, decay over time. So they start out green, then become tasty and yellow, and then not so tasty and uh, you know brown uh, and squishy. Um, 
And so they decay just like uh, nuclei do. And so if you find green bananas, um, then you know two things. First, the, so the green bananas are like the undecayed live radioisotopes. So if you find a green banana, you know first that it had to be made recently because it hasn't decayed yet. Uh, and also, if you're here in Illinois or if you're in Nantucket, you also know it wasn't made here. Uh, we don't grow bananas here. So if you find green bananas, you know it had to be brought here. So the same deal with our radioisotopes from the supernova. They're like green bananas. If you find them, you know they had to be made recently and something had to bring them here. That's the supernova. And it turns out we made a whole list back in the day of interesting kinds of radioactivity to look for. And a particularly interesting kind is a radioactive version of iron. So ordinary iron is not radioactive, but there's a radioactive version for the expert that's called iron 60. It has a half-life of 2.6 million years. So it lasts for a few million years and then it decays. And that is, uh, that's going to be of great interest. And for the experts, there's some other kinds of radioactivity that are of interest too. Um, so, so that's the game plan. We now want to look at the bottom of the ocean for radioactivity from a supernova. Sounds crazy, but uh, some intrepid uh, physicists and geologists actually did this and actually found evidence. Uh, and the evidence was in, for in the form of this thing, which is called a ferromanganese crust. So it's like a rock. And this particular rock you could hold in your hand. It's about that big. Uh, the little coin there is about the size, a little bigger than a quarter. It's about the size of a half dollar. Um, and uh, so you can get the sense of scale. It's a rock you can hold in your hand. So these things are at the bottom of the ocean. Typically, you find them in the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Um, and what they are is uh, ordinary rocks, some ordinary rocks on the bottom of the ocean will grab atoms of iron and manganese and some other atoms as well, but mostly iron and manganese from the water. And they attach to the rock. It's a little bit like rust. They're chemically attached. They're not just sitting on top. They're chemically attached. And this, and this layer of mostly iron and manganese grows very slowly with time. So the rock gets encrusted with this iron and manganese uh, uh, layers. Um, and the layers grow very slowly, a millimeter per million years. Your hair grows much faster than this. Your fingernails might grow much faster than this. Um, so the, so this, this, this crust you're seeing here it's, uh, you can hold it in your hand, there's many millimeters there, so it's probing back many millions of years, which is perfect because we want to know what happened millions of years ago. And then we need to, to measure this, we need ultra sensitive measurements for the experts, this is called uh, accelerator mass spectrometry, which is good at finding needles and haystacks. And so what you do is you dig down in this rock and look at different layers. Uh, and uh, what you want, what you expect to see is nothing, nothing, nothing. And then one layer, you'll find radioactivity from the supernova and then nothing, nothing, nothing. And that would be our green bananas. Um, and lo and behold, this is what we found. So here is the result. Here's the actual data. Uh, so forgive me for showing a plot, but I couldn't contain myself. It's the one plot I'll show. Um, and so this shows as we go back in time, that's the horizontal axis. So zero, two, four, six, eight, ten 10 million years ago. So the deeper we go in the crust, so the further back in time we are, we can date that. So this is telling us how deep in the crust, how far back in time we are. And then the vertical axis, so is telling us how much of this iron 60, this radioactive form of iron there is. And you can see that there's two basic features on this plot. There's this noisy looking scatter of points and that's just noise. So that's the noise in their experiments. For the experts, it's the nickel 60, the stable isobar. So if that's all you saw, that's noise, that's nothing. That would mean they found nothing. But that's not all they found. Uh, the amazing thing is they found this. About two to three million years ago, they found this pulse of iron 60 that's not in the noise. It's way above the noise. So those are our green bananas. So that's very good. Um, so they found a signal between two and three million years ago. Uh, and that's amazing because that's what we should expect. If we have a supernova, we found a pulse. We can tell you when it happened two to three million years ago. And that's just fantastic. Um, the other thing that's maybe not so obvious is the amount of iron 60 is incredibly tiny. That's why we need this big nuclear physics lab. Uh, the amount of iron 60 for every atom of iron 60, there are 10 to the 15 atoms of ordinary iron. So it's an, it's an incredible feat to even measure this stuff. Okay. Um, so that was a result from almost 20 years ago. Um, in 2016, there was this flood of new results uh, and measuring more of these crazy crusts from the bottom of the ocean, uh, also ocean sediments. Uh, so what you're seeing here, this thing that looks like peanut butter is a half of a drill core from the bottom of the ocean where you pull up a bunch of mud from many, many, many feet uh, of, uh, of a, a column under the ocean. And 
And that grows much more rapidly over time, the mud does. Um, and that's very handy for us uh, because, uh, and, it's, and it's inhabited by these little micro fossils and, uh, and it contains iron in it that we can go look for. Um, if this stuff was implanted on the earth, it should also be implanted on the moon. And so we should be able to find it on the moon. And that in fact was done. So here is an astronaut from Apollo 14. So after, uh, uh, so after the one, uh, one small step, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, actually, sorry, it was Apollo 12. And before uh, Houston, we have a problem. And that's them taking one of the exact samples where more of this radioactivity was found. Um, and then also in high energy particles that uh, come in from space, those also contain iron 60 and they need a recent nearby source. And it's even found in Antarctica snow today. So there's actually some of this stuff is still falling on our heads today. Um, and we even know about a runaway stellar corpse uh, that could be the, uh, the, the cinder left over from the explosion. Um, and so to give you an idea of where we are, so this is a map of the Earth, and all of these points are places where this crazy radioactive iron has been measured. And you can see it's now measured all around the Earth, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, a bunch of different oceans, and in Antarctica, and on the moon. Um, so uh, there are just a, a wealth of data now. So it's really clear that this uh, that this happened. Um, and so this is where we were before this rush of data. So we had this data with this uh, this pulse of iron, and now we've got a huge amount of data. So sorry, the same plot again. But now we've got a bunch of new data with all of these points. You can't even make sense of them all because there's so many different measurements. That the, all I'm really trying to show you with this plot is just a whole bunch of measurements. And um, uh, the key thing to appreciate is all the measurements say something put iron 60, this radioactive stuff on the earth two to three million years ago. And there's now data and some data, which I didn't show you, uh, that says there's another signal seven or eight million years ago. So there's actually two signals of radioactivity on the bottom of the ocean. So near earth supernova explosions happen. That's the lesson. This is this really happened. Um, and very recently, there's even more developments because there's another kind of radioactivity, which is a form of plutonium, which again, if you see the movie Oppenheimer, that will show up. Uh, plutonium is one of the heaviest atoms known. And this plutonium 244 is nice because it lives for a very long time. So it can reach back further into the past. And it's only made in the most extreme explosions. Um, and in 2021, uh, so just a couple of years ago, uh, it was found in another one of these crazy deep ocean crusts. So you see this iron 60, the second peak of iron 60, but now we also see it has plutonium. And, and we don't actually know what's going on because uh, that's made not only in supernova explosions, but we actually think it's mostly made not in supernova explosions at all, but when the cinders of supernova explosions, neutron stars bang into each other and make uh, these, these colossal collisions. Um, and, uh, and the fact that we see this plutonium actually suggests that we might even have yet another event. We might've had a nearby merger of neutron stars. Okay, so far so good. So I think we're just about out of time. Am I right, Janelle? You are at the pre-five minute warning. Great. Okay. So with that, uh, let me uh, just talk a little bit about astro disasters. Um, so, uh, so now we have it. Now we see that nearby supernovae are a fact of life. We have evidence for this. Uh, and so, uh, so is this a big deal or not? Uh, well, first of all, these events that we had three million years ago, seven million years ago, uh, were they dangerous? They were actual nearby supernova explosions. Were they dangerous? Um, and uh, uh, well, and as you recall, how dangerous a supernova is depends on how close you are. It's like, like with fireworks. If you see the fireworks from far away, they're fun to watch, but they're not dangerous. If you get too close, not, not a good idea. It's the same with supernova explosions. So how do we know how far away these supernovae were? All we did was measure these iron 60 atoms. Well, it turns out the supernova debris is spread over space. And so the amount of debris that comes to you depends on how close you stand to the supernova. You stand really close, you gather a bunch of debris, not in a good way necessarily if you're too close, but if you're far away, the debris gets so dispersed, you don't get very much. And it turns out the number of atoms you receive is proportional to the area of the sphere where you're standing around the supernova. And so it's proportional to one over the distance squared. It's an inverse square law for the experts. Uh, and so because it depends on the distance from the star, by looking at the amount of iron 60, the number of radioactive atoms, we can work out how far away the explosion was. And it's somewhere between 60 and 300 light years, which is a pretty big range, but it's still an interesting range uh, because 
it's first of all tells us it's further than the kill distance, which is about 30 light years. But it tells us this thing was kind of a near miss. It wasn't quite close enough to do damage, but it was close enough that it was still something that would have gotten the full attention of anybody who looked up and saw it. And there's active research on whether there were some consequences, not a huge mass extinction, but maybe there were some climate effects and maybe there were some vulnerable species that did uh, suffer ill effects because of the supernova. Um, so with that, in lieu of time, uh, we also actually have uh, some, uh, some ideas that there might've been an earlier supernova explosion that had a worse effect, but uh, I'll let you ask about if that if you're interested, and let me uh, let me jump to uh, uh, where I want to leave you. So my the outlook I want to leave you with is uh, so what I want you to appreciate is that live radioactive iron, this iron sixty, has been seen globally and on the moon, and we see signals uh, from two different pulses, so two different nearby supernova explosions, three and about seven million years ago. We've also found plutonium, which might mean there's even a even earlier thing that happened near. Us. Um, and something I get, uh, get, didn't get to talk about is uh, we suspect that there might have been a supernova hundreds of millions of years ago that was really close, closer than even these things, and caused biological damage. If you want, I can say more about that. Um, so this is cool because it's the birth of supernova archaeology. And in keeping with Mariah Mitchell, it's beautiful because it's so interdisciplinary because it connects astronomy, physics, astrobiology, evolutionary biology. Um, and uh, and the, also the nice thing is this is a young field. There's still a, a lot left to do. It's still in its infancy and a lot of questions to answer. So we'd like to better understand how supernovae get their material on Earth. So me and a lot of the people you see in these pictures are working hard on this. Uh, we the, the All of these measurements give us a chance to better learn how supernovae make elements in the first place. Um, and we're not done making measurements. Uh, we'd like there to be more measurements of other kinds of radioactivity. Uh, other sites. So we're going back to the moon. Uh, and the Chinese recently have also brought back samples for the moon. And that's super interesting. And it would be of great interest to look at more samples from the moon. And they can tell us interesting things like they might even tell us which direction the supernova was. If you want, I can say more about that. And then again, there's something I had to skip. There was an extinction that happened at the what's called the end of the Devonian period, uh, 300 plus million years ago. And we think that might be due to a supernova. And I can say more about that. So, uh, so there's uh, there's a lot yet to come. So with that, uh, I say to stay tuned. Um, and I'll just leave you with the thought I began with that. Um, and if you saw the uh, if you saw the eclipse uh, in 2017, you uh, this is a nice example of what uh, of uh, of this point. And if you didn't see it, there's another one coming in 2024. Uh, so I recommend you see this April of 2024. Um, and uh, the nice thing about the eclipse, it was so beautiful and uh, really quite uh, um, quite noumenal, uh, was that it's a, it's a reminder that we're citizens of the larger cosmos. So we don't just live in our parochial lives, that we're citizens of the larger cosmos and cosmic events can have uh, an impact on our lives. And in the case of the eclipse, it was a beautiful, harmless impact on our lives. But as you see, uh, from uh, what I've been talking about today, once in a long while, the uh, the way that the cosmos can intervene with our lives uh, can be uh, with uh, rather more of a vengeance. So with that, I will stop. Thank you for your attention, remind you of all the conclusions. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Fields. That was breathtaking in earnest. And for our audience this evening, if you have any questions or rather the questions that you do have that are circling in your mind, if you can pop those into the Q&A into the chat box, I'm happy to read them to you, Dr. Fields, for you to answer as they come up. Also feel free to raise your hands. I can give you control to speak verbally, directly rather to Dr. Fields. I would like for me in this moment, if you can tell us more about the end of Onion period, <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, so checks in the mail. You you went for the setup. So, uh, um, uh, right. So let me. I, I can't resist. There's. I, I won't. I won't show you a bunch of slides. Uh, but I was genuinely dying to know. So, <laughs> but I'll just show you one. So, uh, so the long story short is, right after the pandemic started, we caught wind of a new geological result. Uh, 
where there is this period called the Devonian period, which is uh, the 360 million years ago. Um, and so this is before the dinosaurs. Um, uh, so it goes it goes very back, very far back in the history of of life or complex life on Earth. And there was an extinction then. In fact, what really happened is there was a gradual die off of species, what they call a diversity crisis, because the, the species were slowly dying off. But right at the end, there were these really rapid punctuated uh, extinctions where very rapidly a bunch of species all died off. And there were a couple of them. Um, and uh, and there's this geological result where they found when these last punctuated extinctions, these rapid die-offs occurred, they found evidence that there was uh, 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 a catastrophic loss of ozone on the Earth. Um, and uh, if you remember back, a supernova near the Earth strips away the ozone layer. And, and, and so we couldn't resist saying, hey, could it be that this was due to a supernova explosion? It doesn't have to be due to a supernova explosion, but it might be. So just finding the lack of ozone, there potentially are other uh, explanations. So could a supernova have done this? And this is uh, from a simulation, this sort of scream-like image is from a simulation of a supernova that's close enough to do damage. Um, and uh, so could a supernova have done this? Well, a supernova creates ozone loss and it irradiates Earth with high energy particles called cosmic rays, and those are all bad news. So how would we know if this really is what caused this extinction, we don't know. Um, but there are tests we can make to find out one way or the other. So it turns out these high energy particles, these cosmic rays will have other consequences than just killing things. They can affect the climate. They can create lightning and fires that we can hope to find evidence for, the soot and all of that. Um, and uh, they, these high energy particles will have, will be damaging to different species. They should be particularly bad. They go down to like half a mile and they're particularly bad for megafauna. There are these giant creatures uh, and it'd be bad for them. Um, and supernovae are social. So you're supposed to have more than one event. Remember supernovae come in clusters and the fact that there were multiple punctuated extinctions might tell us we have a, a cluster of stars nearby. And then finally, the real uh, sort of smoking gun would be to find radioactivity from, uh, from the potential supernovae. And the plutonium would be an interesting thing to look at. And for the experts, there's something called Samarium 146 that would also be of interest to look for, but not easy to find. So, uh, so with that, uh, I, think, I think we have a brave question. We do. Joseph asks, are there any identifiable shells that would correspond to the two signals? I forget the years, 2 million, 8 million. Yeah, you remember very well. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, right. Yes, very good. So thank you very much. Checks in the mail. So it turns out uh, I have a slide for that. Uh, that's exactly the right question. So I just showed you like the picture behind my head. If a supernova blows up, it makes a big bubble. Well, is there any chance we can see uh, the the remains of the the nearby supernova, uh, the bubble that it left behind? Um, and lo and behold, there is such a thing, and we live inside of it. So it turns out, completely independent of all this work, astronomers in the past thirty plus years have realized that the sun lives in a region of very hot, low density, that is to say, rarefied gas. So we live in a bubble of hot gas. And uh, astronomers call them like they see us. It's a bubble that surrounds us, so we call it the local bubble. Um, and this is an artist's conception of what this might look like. So there's the sun, and we're surrounded by this bubble. And it's a gigantic bubble. It's 150 light years across, uh, bigger in some places. And, uh, and to make a bubble that big, you need not just a nearby supernova, you need something like 10 or more nearby explosions over the past, say, 10 million years to make a bubble this big. So we live inside the bubble. Um, and uh, and the idea would be that uh, um, the uh, the uh, the radioactivity that we see would be from some of the more recent uh, explosions in this bubble that probably went on for the past ten million years. Um, and there's even uh, some some ideas about uh, the clusters of stars that are likely to be where this might have come from. So great question. Amazing. We'll wait for everyone else who's also shy in the audience to put some questions in the chat box. What advice would you have for any young budding astrophysicists who might want to explore this very, as you mentioned, infant stage of research? Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, right. So, in fact, uh, when I started to work on this, 
I would uh, I wouldn't give this to PhD students. Uh, so you know, part of the wonderful one of the wonderful parts of my job at University of Illinois is I get to have PhD students, and we've got really excellent students, uh, and they're very clever and go on to do great research. Um, but I was afraid to give this problem to them because, uh, it, you know, it, at first it seemed so crazy that I thought they would never get a job. They would never get a research job after that because oh, you work on this crazy stuff. Uh, so it was only after this flood of data came in that I would dare to actually give it to PhD students. Now I'm all in. I've got PhD students working on it. Um, so... Um, but the nice thing is because this touches on a lot of different kinds of science, uh, there's lots of ways into this, uh, into this problem. So we have people working on this that are interested in astrophysics and that's sort of my line of work. So we're interested in what, uh, what does astrophysics tell us about how this would have gone down and how can we use the data we've got to infer something about the star that exploded, the nature of this bubble that we live in uh, and how supernovae distribute their elements in space. Um, so, but there, are, there's also work to be done for the people who do these uh, incredibly accurate nuclear physics experiments that allow us to detect these particles. There's work for geologists, um, and there's work for observational astronomers who want to study supernovae generally and see how we can map on these very near by results with what we know about supernovae throughout our galaxy and throughout the universe. And so there's lots of different ways to work on this problem. And uh, depending on how young you are, the first thing you need to do is uh, uh, is pick up a lot of math and science and probably watch some science fiction for inspiration. Um, and that's a good way to get started. Why the science fiction for inspiration? Right. Cause you, 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 gotta, you gotta stay curious and ask questions. <laughs> Amazing. What thought would you like to leave us with? Let's see. What is well, a culminating thought that right. you felt like maybe you didn't cover? You'd like to Let's see. Um, yeah. So I think right. The 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 main point is uh, uh, is I just hope I've gotten you given you an idea of how um, uh, 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 how remarkable it is that um, uh, that the one of the amazing things about science is that. Uh, um, uh, it's possible to uh, to to perform these sort of miraculous measurements. And I should say, by the way, I am a theorist, so I do theoretical calculations. I didn't make any of these beautiful measurements that I told you about. They're beautiful, uh, but they're not mine. So I can brag about them because they are not mine. Um, and uh, and it's these incredibly sensitive measurements which allow us to detect these this incredibly tiny signal of material from a supernova that is otherwise imperceptible. You would never notice it. It, the amount of radioactivity is you would never detect it in your everyday life, but nonetheless, they were able to discover this tiny traces of iron 60, and that's enough to tell us uh, this amazing story that there had to be a supernova near the Earth. And that's one of the, the amazing things uh, about science with very, uh, with very clever measurements. Uh, if you uh, if you if you work really hard and think really hard, then by making measurements of sometimes very subtle effects, uh, they can tell you a really big story about how the universe works. Amazing. What would you or rather, would you say that right now within this field that all the just all of the alternate disciplines that let me reframe my question. Would you say that currently, even though this is an interdisciplinary field, is everyone working in silos or is it really collaborative at this young stage? Yeah, so um, I would say at this young stage, uh, um, uh, most people don't know this exists. Uh, and so part of my, my job is to go around and try to tell anyone who will listen about this stuff. Uh, uh, both people who are active scientists and people who are just interested, because a lot of people don't even know, don't even know this is a thing. Um, and so, um, and so, part of what we try to do is, uh, you know, find occasions to go to conferences outside of our comfort zone, where we can let other groups of people like go to a geology conference. I don't know any geology, but we go to a geology conference to try to let the geologists know this is a thing, and you guys can make really big contributions. You know, if we put our heads together. Um, and so, um, uh, because otherwise the fields are so siloed, we don't even know, most of us don't know what the other field is doing at all. So, so just having that kind of communication is super important. So that's an that's excellent point. And that's, that's, that's what we're you know, forever trying to do is, uh, is let people know about this so that we get you know, other people to have good ideas. To better integrate all of the fields together. 
So thus, would you recommend for students in them staying curious to also keep their path really open and not really pigeonhole themselves just to math and science? Would it be beneficial for them if this was an area of interest for them to be a little bit more flexible and versatile? I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously it helps to, to you know, to learn as much as you can. Um, and um, and you never know, you know, what to, the, the things you learn, you never know when you're going to use them. And so uh, so, you know, in this in this line of work, I'm constantly surprised by having to rely on things that I vaguely remember from high school, which is like <laughs> the last time I took chemistry or biology. Nothing to be proud of. It's just true. Um, and so um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm forever impressed with uh, how much it helps to have learned as much as you can when you're young, because you just never know when you're going to you're going to use stuff that you thought you never would. Mm -hmm. What do you hope to discover from gathering this theory, this research? What do, what would be your big aha from all of this? Well, um, uh, I guess in the near term, uh, uh, something I'm particularly excited about is, uh, you know, we found this plutonium. Uh, and right now, the first measurements were not uh, uh, you know, it's a very, very difficult measurement. So the first measurement showed this plutonium, but didn't give us much information about whether the plutonium arrived just when the other material from the supernova arrived, or whether it arrived independently at different times. Um, but there's been, uh, uh, but there's been uh, new work that uh, will shed light on that. And that isn't public yet, but I'm very eager for that because uh, that's pretty important because this plutonium, one of the biggest questions in uh, in all of astrophysics today is where do the very heaviest elements like gold, uranium, plutonium, where do they come from? And, uh, and it turns out that's a really hard question. Um, but here, the nature has handed us this wonderful thing. It says something near the earth put plutonium on the earth. And if we can make some more of these clever measurements and see what came with the plutonium, uh, then that will give us a new insight to where plutonium comes from. And, uh, and that's going to happen pretty soon. And so I'm super interested in that because that has that, 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 that ultimately tells us uh, a major part of where the elements are, came from in the first place. Um, and I suppose a longer term goal, like I said, would be to see if there's uh, if there's any mass extinction on Earth. Uh, so this is kind of swinging for the fences. There are a number of major mass extinctions. People are familiar with the dinosaurs, and people actually thought the dinosaurs might have been killed by a supernova. There are there are there's, there was serious research on this, um, but it turns out a gigantic asteroid or comet fell on their heads, um, and uh, so it was death from above, but not from a supernova. Um, but that's only the most recent and least bad mass extinction. There were four major mass extinctions prior to that. And like I said, we found one, the second major mass extinction um, that uh, we think might be due to a supernova. And it would be remarkable to, to just see whether that holds up or not. One way or the other, it would just be nice to have, have enough data to find an answer to that. What would you say is next for you? I know I'm just firing off all the questions as we get another one in the chat. <laughs> so, uh, right. So, uh, uh, so well, let's see what's next. Is uh, like I said, we're, we're there, since I'm not the doing the uh, the measurements, so we're part, partly we're waiting for some new measurements. But there's plenty of more stuff to be done. So, with uh, with an array of students, some of whose pictures were on my last slide, uh, there's a number of questions we're working on now. Um, uh, both about trying to understand better how the explosion would have affected uh, Earth and also from the data we have, uh, what that will tell us about uh, supernovae, how they make elements, and how the elements are distributed over space. And so I've got some, I just I just graduated two wonderful grad students who are now off doing their own research elsewhere. And I've got some excellent new graduate students and some wonderful and a wonderful undergraduate who this summer have already done a, a lot of work that, uh, that you'll be seeing in an astrophysics journal near you soon. Well, we definitely look forward to that. Any advice for amateur astrophysicists like myself? How can we get involved? How can we support moving this forward? Oh, yeah. So uh, make sure everybody knows that there were near supernova explosions near the Earth because no, not enough people know that. Um, and uh, um, 
And then uh, uh, one of the things you can do is, uh, well, as an amateur astronomer, you can you can see the remains of some nearby uh, from supernovae in our own galaxy. So I mentioned the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula you can see with your naked eye, uh, but with a telescope, it is absolutely spectacular. Um, and uh, there are a few other examples like that of uh, supernova remains that are accessible with even just a modest telescope or even binoculars. So some of these things you can see for yourself uh, the, the, the result, which again is like necessary for life. You can see these are the cauldrons where new elements are made, but you feel sorry for all the poor critters on the stars nearby because for them, it's not so funny. They were, they were caught in a nearby supernova. So all that drama is sort of out there to be seen. Amazing. Dr. Fields, I just wanted to share, Jim Hendrickson shared that he is very thankful for this presentation and he's looking forward to learning more about supernova archaeology. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much. And again, thanks for coming on this. I looked up the weather. It looks like it's a beautiful night in Nantucket. And so that's this, you know, beautiful summer night in Nantucket. That's a precious thing. So thanks for taking Absolutely. a little time away from it. So. <laughs> it has sincerely been our pleasure to host you this evening. I wanted to just say thank you again so much for sharing your expertise with us, your enthusiasm and your knowledge. And on behalf of the Mariah Mitchell Association, thank you so much, Dr. Fields. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with before we let our viewers go for the evening? No, again, just thank, thank, thank you for your time and uh, uh, stay curious and keep looking up. Amazing. Well, with that statement, that concludes our science speaker presentation for this evening. Again, I'm jean Al Gurley, Director of Science and Programs at Mariah Mitchell Association, and it's been such an honor to host Dr. Fields with us this evening. Thank you to Bank of America, our lead sponsor, as well as to Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and the White Elephant Hotels and Resorts of Nantucket and Palm Beach. Without further ado, I set everyone free to enjoy their lovely evening. Thank you, everyone.